Mangroves, their anchors in the water, walked with the canoe. The swift, racing its brown shadow, screeched, then veered into a dark inlet. It was the last sound Ashil knew from the other world. He feathered the paddle, stared away from the groping mangroves whose muddy shells slipped, watered the crocodiles, splitting the parts of their eyes. Then the horned river horses rolling over themselves could capsize the keel. It was like the African movies he had yelled at in childhood. The endless river unread, unreeled these images that flickered into real mirages. Naked mangroves walking beside him, knotted logs wriggling into the water. The wet, yawning boulders of oven-mouthed hippopotami. A skeletal warrior stood up straight in the stern and guided his shoulders, clamped his neck in cold iron and altered the oar. Ashil wanted to scream. He wanted the brown water to harden into a road, but the river widened ahead and closed behind him. He heard screeching laughter in a swaying tree as monkeys swung from the rafter of their treehouse and the bared sound rotted the sky like their teeth. For hours, the river gave the same show for nothing. The canoe's mouth muttered its lie. The deepest terror was the mud, the mud with no shadow like the clear sand. Then the river coiled into a bend. He saw the first signs of men, tall, sapling, fishing stakes. He came into his own beginning and his end, for the swiftness of a second is all that memory takes. Now the strange inimical river surrenders its stealth in the sunlight, and a light inside him wakes, skipping centuries, ocean and river, and time itself. And God said to Ashil, look, I give you permission to come home. His eyes send the sea swift as a pilot, the swift whose wings is the sign of my crucifixion. And thou shalt have no God, should in case you forgot my commandments. And Ashil felt the homesick shame and pain of his Africa. His heart and his bare head were bursting as he tried to remember the name of the river and the tree god in which he stared, whose hollow body carried him to the settlement ahead. He remembered this sunburnt river with its spindly stakes and the peaked huts platformed above the spindles where thin, naked figures as he rode past, looked unkindly or kindly in their silence. The silence an old fence kindles in a boy's heart. They walked with his homecoming canoe past bonfires in a scorched clearing near the edge of the soft lit shallows whose, non, whose noise hurt his drumming heart as the pirog slid its raw painted wedge towards the crazed sticks of a vine-fastened pear. The river was sloughing its old skin like a snake in wrinkling sunshine. The sun resumed its empire over this branch of the Congo. The prow found its stake in the river and nuzzled it the way that a piglet finds its favorite dove in the sweet grunting sow. And now each cheek ran with its own clear rivulet of tears as Ashil, weeping, fastened the bow of the dugout, wiped his eyes with one dry palm and felt a hard hand help him up the shaking pier. Half of me was with him, one half with the midshipman by a Dutch canal, but now neither was happier nor unhappier than the other. An old man put an arm around Ashil, and the crowd chattering followed both. They touched his trousers, his undershirt, their hands scrabbling the texture as a kitten does with cloth, till they stood before an open hut. The sun stands with expectant silence. The river stops talking the way silence, silence sometimes suddenly turns off a market. The winds squatted along the grass. A man kept walking steadily towards him, and he knew by that walk it was himself and his father, the white teeth, the widening hands. He sought his own features in those of their life giver and saw two worlds mirrored there. The hair was surf curling round the sea rock, the forehead a frowning river, as they swirled in the estuary of a bewildered love. And time stood between them, 
the only interpreter of her lips joined babble, the river with the foam, and the chuckles of water under the sticks of the pier where the tribe stood like sticks themselves, reversed by reflection. Then they walked up to the settlement, and it seemed as they chatted, everything was rehearsed for ages before this. He could predict the intent of his father's gestures. He was moving with the dead. Women paused at their work and smiled at the warrior, returning from his battle with smoke from the kingdom where he had been captured. They cried and were happy. Then the fishermen sat near a large tree under whose dome stones sat in a circle. His father said, Aholabi, touching his own heart, in the place you have come from, what do they call you? Time translates. Tapping his chest, the son answers, Ashil. The tribe wrestles, Ashil. Then, like cedars at sunrise, the mutterings settle. Ashil, what does the name mean? I have forgotten the one that I gave you, but it was, it seems, many years ago. What does it mean, Ashil? Well, I too have forgotten. Everything was forgotten. You also. I do not know. The deaf sea has changed around every name that you gave us. Trees, men. We yearn for a sound that is missing. Apolari. A name means something. The qualities desired in a son and even a girl child. So even the shadows were called you expected one virtue, since every name is a blessing. Since I, remembering the hope I had for you as a child, unless the sound means nothing, then you would be nothing. Did they think you were nothing in that other kingdom? Ashil, I do not know what the name means. It means something, maybe. What's the difference? In the world I come from, we accept the sounds we were given. Men, trees, water. And therefore, Ashil, if I pointed and I said, there is the name of that man, that tree, and this father, would every sound be a shadow that crossed your ear? without the shape of a man or a tree, what would it be? And just as branches sway in the dusk from their fear of amnesia, of oblivion, the tribe began to breathe. Ashil, what would it be? I can only tell you what I believe, or had to believe. It was prediction and memory, to bear myself back, to be carried here by a swift, or the shadow of a swift, making its cross on water with the same sign I was blessed with, with the gift of the sound whose meaning I still do not care to know. Afolabi, no man loses his shadow except it is in the night, and even then his shadow is hidden, not lost. At the glow of sunrise he stands on his own name in that light. When he walks down to the river with the other fishermen, his shadow stretches in the morning and yawns with you, if you are content with not knowing what our names mean, then I am not Afolabi, your father, and you look through my body as a light looks through a leaf. I am not here or a shadow, and you, nameless son, are only the ghost of a name. Why did I never miss you until you returned? Why haven't I missed you, my son, until you were lost? Are you the smoke from a fire that never burned? There was no answer to this, as in life. Ashil nodded the tears glazing his eyes, where the past was reflected as well as the future, the white form lowered its head.